Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here on a Friday. I know most of us are traveling today back to our homes. So I'm going to talk about best practices to peacefully and successfully migrate from password to passwordless. I know to, uh, this week and last week, last year's identity wars, there was a lot of talk of pass keys and moving to passwordless. However, it's not going to be that easy, and that's what we'll learn about from this presentation. So a quick introduction to me. My name is Chintan Jain. I currently work as a senior director and senior principal at uh, Hilton. And uh, I have been in uh, this industry almost 20 years, and I can think that I have a little expertise in consumer identity, authentication, and related fields. I like to speak. I have sp uh, spoken at uh, multiple conferences. I'm a mentor, and I like to volunteer uh, in some of the local nonprofits in Northern Virginia from where I'm from. And I like to innovate. I've done a lot of innovation. I have about 44 approved patents and I've been uh, approved like nine patents in consumer identity and authentication uh, during my role at Capital One. So currently, as I told you, I work at Hilton and I think most of us here have heard about Hilton, right? So yeah, this is the Hilton hotel chain and resorts. And uh, we have about 19 brands. We are in 123 countries, about 7,200 properties and 2,200 more in the pipeline. So almost getting to like uh, 10,000 properties worldwide. Now what that brings is that brings 150 million in Hilton Honor members, which are global travelers, right? It's not just US, they are everywhere. They are in the Americas, they are in the Asia Pacific, they are, they are in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So when we are think about identity and authentication, we have to think about all our customers, not just the US customers. So how do we serve our customers? So mainly we serve our customers from five main channels. One is the Hilton.com channel, which is our main uh, web channel. And then we have an iOS app and Android app, which are the global apps, English apps, right? And then we are increasing our footprint quite a bit in China. So in China, we have three channels how we serve our customers. We have a China iOS app, we have a China Android app, and then we have a WeChat mini program, right? I, I don't know how many of you guys have heard about mini programs, but in China, there is WeChat, which is like a super app. And within that app, there are mini programs. And most of the people, they don't go to app store. Uh, they go to WeChat, and then they download mini programs, and they do all the business in mini programs. So that's a channel that we had to activate to get the business, right? Oops. So what are the current ways of customer authentication? So again, like uh, for us, we it's a traditional username and password authentication, right? And that's where most of us are doing today. We are doing traditional username and password authentication. And then a little flavor of social login providers. So login with Google, login with Facebook. We do login with WeChat uh, because we are in China our customers want login with WeChat. They don't want to remember their Hilton Honors number and password. So they want, so like for us, uh, currently we do the traditional username and password authentication and we, we do login with WeChat. With the Google and Apple on the horizon, right? So, so you know, like uh, this current challenges with this consumer identity, this challenge with the current method of authentications are like people forget their usernames and passwords. For us, uh, on our channel, people use Hilton Honors number as the username, and they will forget their Honors, honors number. And then we have to provide a mechanism for them to log in with their email. So like forgotten username and password is a big concern with the current ways of authentication. Also like, as you see, there have been so many data breaches, so the chances that that email and password are in one of the data bridges is very, very high. So we have billions of compromised credentials on the dark web, right? Um, like of the global users. And then what that results is, it results in account takeover attacks. And then uh, basically it also results in the phishing and social engineering of creds. And then uh, with the social login, the problem is uh, like there are so many social providers. So if we put like, like in the previous slide, if we put like uh, five or six social login providers, and users log in using the social login provider, the next time they come in, they will forget which social login provider they used to create an account, and then they will create another account, so which results in multiple accounts. And then there is engineering effort with enabling social login. So there are, these are all the cha challenges with the consumer identity today, right? 
But so the customers want frictionless ways to log in, but they expect full security and privacy of their accounts. They know, like we know that these are all the problems, but the customers still need ways to log in and they want to log in as seamless as possible, as frictionless as possible. So as we are, like even at Identityverse, we talked about new methods of auth. So we have, we know that there is a problem, there is an industry-wide problem with account takeover attacks. We see a lot of account takeover attacks. We see, like we see that all these data breaches, there are billions of credentials that are compromised. So we know that we have to roll out new methods of auth. But how do we roll out new methods of auth? So like as you see on the screen, there is Hubble Telescope and James Webb Telescope. So think about Hubble Telescope as the password authentication. So when we rolled out the James Webb tele Telescope, which we, like it just happened like a couple of years back now, or last year, did we retire Hubble Telescope? No, right? We are still going to keep uh, the Hubble Telescope. So that's how it is going to be. We are still going to keep passwords. So the additional auth methods that we are going to introduce are going to be complementary. And then whenever we are uh, like uh, implementing new methods of authentication, we need to make sure they, that we account for all the different devices, OS, browsers, combination. As an example, if you think about pass keys, that's a big challenge right now. Like it will work the way it works on uh, Chrome on Windows and Chrome on Apple is going to be completely different. And then, as, we, as I said, we have like billions of users and they are like, like in China, they use a different Android operating system. So the pass keys may not work on them. So like it has, so whatever additional auth methods we are going to implement, they need to be accommodating the different devices and OS browsers. And then the way you introduce new auth methods is you have to create new flows. So you have to keep your current flows, enhance them maybe to introduce new methods, but you keep them. But then like if you are enrolling new customers, at that time you will ask them to do pass keys or some other authentication methods, right? And then one of the very important part is you cannot push additional methods of authentication on the customers. It has to come from them. As an example, in China, like our customers are asking that we want this ways to authenticate. And that's what we are giving them. Because so if you do consumer pull versus business push, you are going to be more successful. Another thing that you can do is add risk-based auth. So as I said, so like there are like uh, the emails and passwords or they, they have been compromised, right? Or the usernames and passwords are, have been compromised. So you can see that if the user is logging using that method, then you have to add risk-based auth when they are logging in. So for us, like a lot of our customers log in using the Hilton honors number and password, which is very secure because the honors number has not been, like it's not in a data breach, like that combination. But if there is an email address that they are using to log in or a username and a password, that's when you need to do risk-based auth. But username and password is still bread and butter. And if you see that the user is logging in using one of these usernames as email address or phone number, then there is a high chance that that credential has been compromised. And then uh, if you detect that, then you have to do a risk check on it and you have to like call a fraud service, third party fraud service, and it will tell you whether to challenge the user or not. So there are like uh, some services available which will, which they have collected billions of compromised credentials. So you can make a call to that service and it will tell you whether that particular uh, credential has been compromised or not. And if it is, then you challenge the user, right? And then ask them to update their password. So another best practice three to create new methods of auth is to offer social login only from very, very limited providers. So as not to confuse the users, not add unnecessary burden on the engineering teams. So only from very trusted providers. So like Apple and Google, right? Like there were some other providers that were very popular, but they have lost confidence. So now the main uh, providers that we see are Apple and Google. And uh, as I said, you have to localize the social login providers. So as an example, in China, uh, people love to use WeChat. So you have to provide uh, a way for them to log in using the WeChat login, right? So you have to localize it and you have to like uh, offer it from very, very limited providers so as not to confuse users. Again, like mobile gives us a very, very easy way to reduce user friction. So like even though you do, there is a password, but you can hide behind the biometric, so, right? So like uh, you can authenticate the customer using the face ID 
and you can store their username and password in the keychain or secure storage, either on the uh, Apple device or the Google Android device. And then whenever they are logging, you do the biometric authentication and give them transparent authentication, right? So like, so they don't have to remember the username and password. So they come to your app, they open it, you do a face ID. It looks like passwordless, but it's not, right? In the background, there is still password because the password is in the keychain, but they don't see it. So that's like the mobile gives you like very, very good way to do it. And it's very easy. So highly recommend to do frictionless login from mobile. Now, another thing that we are seeing in the industry was uh, like, this is something that is happening is passwordless login is happening, but not through pass keys. They are happening through the out of band methods, right? So basically we ask the user to log in with their mobile number. So they enter their mobile number and an SMS code is being sent to their mobile number. And then the user enters that as, uh, mobile that SMS code and they log in, or they log in with the email and the OTP. So basically, they enter their email address. You send them an OTP on their email address and they log in, or log in with email and Magic Link. So again, this is passwords are gone, right? These are all log in with the OTP. But so, but this creates a problem: the account recovery. Like in this case, just think about if the customer lost their phone then how are they going to get that OTP? Or they lost access to the email, how are they going to get the OTP? So in that case, so whenever you enable this kind of flow, you need to have two different methods for account recovery. You cannot just rely on one channel. As an example, right now you have the username and password as your login, but the account recovery mechanism is the email. So there are two channels. So if you enable this method, which is very popular with the, and there is a huge like, this is the way to go right now if you want to do passwordless, but you have to think about the account recovery. Another thing is uh, what this does is if you add this as a first factor authentication, so if you have a user login with their mobile number and an SMS code, you are taking away the second factor authentication, the adaptive auth, right? Because in like when you do a high risk transaction, basically you are challenged with a OTP, but in this case you logged in with that. So how do you now do a challenge mechanism? Because the user already used it as their first factor. So in that case, and I saw this with Meta, what Meta is doing is if you log in, so I, I was traveling somewhere and I logged in with my phone number and code, and what Meta did was they showed me like a list of all my posts and likes and said like, which is the post that you made or which is the post on which you liked, something like that. And there were like some random one and mine one and I was able to select the one correct one and then they logged me in. So in this case, like obviously we are not meta, but we know our customers. So we know like if, like for us, we know that they stayed somewhere, right? So we can challenge them by saying that, very, did you stay in Las Vegas at Resorts World on 20th May, something like that, right? And then show like, and then let the user select it. So you will have to come up with innovative ways to challenge the user because your first, your challenge mechanism is going to be taken away if the user does that. Another thing that we need to really, really consider, and uh, again, like uh, I was in a Gartner, I was talking to a Gartner analyst, and like they said, this is the way to go right now, right? So basically, I showed you the way to do frictionless login from the mobile, where you do the biometric scan, and then do the transparent login by uh, creating, like getting the username and password from the keychain and logging in. But how do you do it, do it on the web, right? So in web, what you can do is you don't, basically you remember the user's cookie, right? When they log in, you remember it. And then when they come to your site, don't time, in the, don't time them out. Let them come in and let them do all the transactions. But whenever they try to do a transaction that you care about and that can create fraud or loss or monetary transaction, as in, a, in our example, like book a room or redeem points, so basically what you're doing is you are like, even though you are not forcing the user to log in, like this user is already logged in and you are sending their data to this online fraud service. So this can be in-house service that you develop. For our case, we uh, like uh, use a third party to do it. And basically we are sending that data to them all the time and they are collecting this data. And they are doing behavioral biometrics on the data. Oops. So, like on every interaction of the customer, we are sending the device, data, contextual, location, data, 
and the passive behavioral biometrics, which means the mouse movements, the uh, clicks of the keyboard. If it is a mobile phone, then touch uh, things on the keyboard. And then you are doing continuous authentication. And then whenever they try to do a high risk transaction that involves like order placement or viewing PII, at that time, you go to the online fraud service and then you ask them for a score. And if you think that the risk score is high, then you ask them for an authentication. So in this case, you eliminated the username and password, right? But you still, and like you can say that if it is a very high risk transaction, then what you can do is you can tell to do like not just the password, but also do the OTP challenge. So it depends on what kind of sensitive transaction it is. At that time, you do both the password and the OTP, or you just do the password. Another thing that, like, again, we talked about a lot here is the pass keys, right? So I know it's a big buzzword in this conference here, but I believe that pass keys are still in the chasm, right? If you read uh, Innovator's Dilemma book from Clayton Christensen, he talks about this product life cycle, and he talks about how whenever a new product comes in, it goes through these five phases. Right? There are innovators who are very excited and they will just uh, like adopt the technology, do innovation, then there are visionaries who are adopters. The main thing is getting to early majority and late majority. That's when you get the mass adoption. If you think about pass keys, so this is great. Like when I wrote this presentation, Google had not come up with pass keys. In the meantime, now Google has come up with pass keys, which is, which is a big thing. But if you go out and see how many people are using pass keys, very, very few. And if you see how they're using it, the user experience is not good at all. And they looks like they have not thought about it. It's just like, uh, like they, they don't have any cross device, cross platform com compatibility. And it's like just not rolled out very perfectly. Even in Google case, they have rolled it out, which is better than others, but there are still a lot of improvements to be made, right? As an example, like the Google, like Chrome with iOS, Chrome on, um, other uh, windows and like how it syncs, where it syncs, all of that things need to be still settled. So f the, some things you can do, adopt a wait and watch approach, right? So do nothing, just keep watching and see how mature it is going to get, right? And then do what Apple does a lot of times, right? Just wait and watch, see, and then when you think it's ready for prime time and people are ready for it, then adopt it. Or you can start a slow rollout on iOS and Android app. Now, another thing is like, as I told you, right, this has to be complementary. This cannot be on its, this cannot stand on its own. Because think about it, if a user, you have a user enroll to your channel just through a pass key, and if they lost their device for some reason, or they sold their device, now how will they log in? Because they don't have the device to authenticate, and they call your customer center. How is the customer center going to support them? So what I believe is going to happen with pass keys, it's there is always going to be a pass key and there is always going to be a second method of authentication that you have to provide. You cannot just rely on pass key. So I think what is going to happen is you will have a pass key and then you will have an option for the user to sign in with an OTP if you are getting rid of passwords. There will never be a case, I cannot think of any case where there will be pass keys can stand on their own. So there will be pass keys for sure it is going to be there in the next five years. A lot of us will be using pass keys. But as providers, as platform providers, we always have to make sure that there is an alternate way for users to sign in, which is going to be an OTP uh, through a phone or through an email. So that is always, because otherwise pass keys cannot stand on their own. And as I told you, global rollout of pass keys will be very, very messy. Because if I think about China, if I think about India, India, and think about how many Android providers there are, how many variations are there. Like as an example, I was talking to a China team and said, hey, let's do pass keys. And they did their research and they came back and said, no, we cannot do pass keys because it's not going to work on the operating systems that we use in China. So even though you do pass keys, it, you will not get like super adoption. And a lot of people, they don't even know what is pass keys, right? Like when you're talking about 100 million customers, some of them not very super technical, 
they will they get confused and then they think that oh pass keys you are collecting my biometric i'm not going to use pass keys so you will continue to provide your complementary methods of authentication so like what i believe is going to happen right and if you are uh, how are you going to mature your consumer identity is obviously level 1 we are all doing level 1 we are doing authentication authorization account registration password management bot management we are all doing that then level 2 is doing sso saml oauth to open id connect social login with providers adaptive access so when you when the user tries to do some high risk transaction then you call the fraud engine and make a determination whether the user needs to be challenged or not online fraud protection multi factor authentication a lot of us are doing this right but not all of us like a lot of us but level 1 you have to do that's the bread and butter level 3 is where i think it's going i think some of us are doing this but this is where it's going like and if it is not then you should put this on your road map login with phone or sms login with email identity affirmation and identity proofing right so like uh, you have to ask users so level 3 is where you get rid of passwords and then you are doing like you are allowing the users to log in with phone sms and email and then level 4 is where it gets a little bit more mature and that's where what you do is you do journey time orchestration so like it's like you go and you want to take a flight you go to the airport first time they check you right they check your id let you in then they check your id and boarding pass both then they check your uh, luggage and then again when you are boarding they check your identity journey time and then journey time orchestration meaning there are different people doing different things like the person who gave you entry is not the person who is going to check you in or do your security check right they are all so journey time orchestration means when the customer is going through your product uh, experience you decide which per which service you want to call to continuously authenticate them and for that like in this conference um, i saw a lot of uh, products being developed that does orchestration really well right i saw like i'm not going to name names but i think this is where the industry thinks we are going uh, like we are doing creating a lot of service because it's very hard to write orchestration services but it's great that the industry has come together and they are creating this products that will help us do the journey time orchestration and continuous authentication which is like already talked about and then fido and pass keys right so you see fido and pass keys is level 4 and it doesn't even come into picture until you do level 3 and then centralized decentralized identity that's something coming but i think that's that's far away i think that's going to take a lot of time because that is still evolving so how are we doing on time we have okay we have 2 minutes so do we do questions or we only have a couple of minutes so if you have any questions then good so with your Hold on. yeah so wechat mini program only works in the wechat like login with wechat only works on because the way it works i don't know it used whatsapp it's like whatsapp right wechat is like kind of whatsapp so they don't have like a real authentication but when like in whatsapp basically it has your identity like when you set it up it will send you a text on your phone and that becomes you so in china we uh, wechat mini program it's like that right so when the first time we they have to link they are hilton honors number with the wechat mini program but then if they go to our ios android app or hilton.china app then they cannot use login with wechat then they have to use their username and password but they might send you to the app and they have through the honors number yeah they have to link like first time they log in with wechat in that experience they have to link their honors number with the wechat mini program and then they can continue to log in with wechat then they don't even have to log in okay. for a certain time and then we reauthenticate them so how is login with phone and email 
safer than doing is SSO along with some MFA, using them as second factor? Uh, yeah, like, see, the thing is you have to eliminate password, right? So with SAML and SSO, you still have a password. So this is the next evolution where you will not have a password anymore. So log in with a phone and log in with email, you're getting rid of password altogether. And some of the user studies have shown that that getting a huge adoption. People like that. They don't want to remember their passwords. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have the risk based authentication. So like even like one of the things you do is you log in the user with a password or the phone or the email and then you store that cookie, right? And then they try to do any high risk transaction. That's when you call your fraud service, get the score, and then you challenge them. Yes. We have not run into problems. Like China services, they need an ICP license. So like whenever we operate in China, we have to make sure the service that we are using has those licenses. So we are able to find services even in the US, services that have those ICP licenses. So that's the one thing that you have to check. Yes, yes. So we're out of time. So I wanna thank you for, for such an informative um, session. Will you be around to answer any other questions? Yes. After? Okay, great. So for, um, we're wrapping up this session, so please um, fill out the survey so we could improve our content for next year, as well as uh, download briefings will be there as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.